Well, good morning, everyone. At the end of the last story about the Shunammite woman um, when she got her property back, I promised you a bit of a shocker. And the story that we're looking at today really is quite shocking. You might also suggest that it's deeply unpleasant and it's more like something you imagine a scriptwriter would have put into a TV show like Game of Thrones or a film like Lord of the Rings. There's extreme violence and seemingly dodgy actions of deceit sanctioned by Elisha. At least that's how it first appears. Like some narratives in the Bible, it leaves us with questions and certainly doesn't work as a template for how we should live our lives. Not at first viewing. But it's not there for that purpose. However, I do believe that there are some really important applications we can garner from this short story. So here we go, I'll read it. It's from 2 Kings chapter 8 and verse 7. And I'm reading from the message version. Elisha travelled to Damascus. Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, was sick at the time. He was told, the holy man is in town. The king ordered Hazael, take a gift with you and go meet the holy man. Ask God through him, am I going to recover from this sickness? Hazael went and met with Elisha. He brought with him every choice thing he could think of from Damascus. Forty camel loads of items. When he arrived, he stood before Elisha and said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, sent me here to ask you, Am I going to recover from this sickness? Elisha answered, Go and tell him. Don't worry, you live. The fact is, though, God showed me that he's doomed to die. Elisha then stared hard at Haziel, reading his heart. Haziel felt exposed and dropped his eyes. Then the holy man wept. Haziel says, Why does my master weep? Because, said Elisha, I know what you're going to do to the children of Israel. Burn down their forts. Murder their youth. Smash their babies. Rip open their pregnant women. Aziel said, Am I a mongrel dog that I do such a terrible thing? God showed me, said Elisha that you will be king of Aram. Haziel left Elisha and returned to his master, who asked, So, what did Elisha tell you? He told me, Don't worry, you'll live. But the very next day, he took a heavy quilt, soaked it in water, covered the king's face, and suffocated him. Now, Aziel was king. Hmm, what a story. I remember some time ago someone saying to me, or maybe I, I read it, can you imagine how different the world might be if someone had reached out to Adolf Hitler when he was a struggling artist in Vienna and told him about the love of Jesus? Maybe it could all have been so terribly different. And indeed, maybe it could have. It seems in this story that Elisha has it within his, his power or his grasp to save Israel. But instead, he seems to goad this guy, Haziel, to commit regicide, to kill the king. Elisha also seems to be telling him to lie to the king so that he can achieve his aims. The whole thing seems a barrack and not what a prophet, a prophetic servant of God would be all about. However, we're perhaps looking at the story from the wrong 
behind it. To get straightened up, we need to go back to 1 Kings chapter 19. You remember the story where Elijah, who was Elisha's mentor and prophet to the people before him, uh, has done a runner to the hills after Queen Jezebel threatens to kill him. And in an encounter, an encounter with God, he is given three things to do. And I'm quoting here. God said, go back the way you came through the desert to Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel. Make him king over Aram. Then anoint Jehu, king over Israel. And finally anoint Elisha to succeed you as prophet. Anyone who escapes death by Haziel will be killed by Jehu. And anyone who escapes death by Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Meanwhile, I'm preserving for myself 7,000 souls, the knees that haven't bowed to the god Baal, the mouths that haven't kissed his image. And so we find out afterwards that um, uh, Elisha fulfills the, the, the vision that are the, the words that are given to Elijah. Uh, in fact, the only thing that Elijah, Elijah managed to do was to get Elisha as his successor and servant. And it's Elisha who anoints uh, uh, Haziel and Jehu as kings. But God has ordained that Haziel will be his instrument of judgment on the people who have consistently time and time again turned away from the one true God to the fertility God of Baal. Up to now in the story, we see that Elisha has been used by God to bring his people relief from the Aramean army, from Ben-Hadad, who had invaded uh, Samaria and caused that, um, that terrible famine. However, time is up and the reckoning is about to start. The first question, of course, we have to ask is, why would Elisha go to Damascus, the capital of Aram? And perhaps God compelled him to go because it was time. Time for God's judgment to start. It's obvious that Elisha is held in very high esteem by the king, Ben Hadad, because he sends Haziel to ask him whether he'll recover from the illness. And um, he says, you know, that this guy will tell me uh, that God will reveal it to him. So he knows uh, Elisha's reputation. And Haziel greets Elisha with great reverence, referring to the king as Elisha's son. In other words, calling Elisha father, which would have made, it was a Middle Eastern way of elevating the person that he was speaking with. And he also sent him a massive gift. Um, a lot of commentators think this is hyperbole, and maybe it was, but it was a huge gift. And I wondered whether Ben-Hadad, the king, thought the bigger the gift the more likely I'll get good news. And sometimes I wonder whether we can be a bit like that too. Certainly some people uh, have acted like that, where they believe that they can curry favour with God, particularly towards the end of their lives. They think if they're generous towards uh, God and towards the church, that they can somehow influence God to squeeze them into heaven. But simply, that's not how it works. The gift of God, which is eternal life, is free and cannot be bought. It's only found in Jesus. And then true generosity is found because Jesus changes our heart and that's what compels us to give. Anyway, Elisha does an amazing thing. He tells Haziel to tell the king he'll recover knowing that he'll be killed. Some of the rabbis were so outraged by Elisha's actions that earlier versions of the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, scribes changed the word of the text to Elisha saying uh, that he will not live. They only had to change one letter to do that. However, it's definitely not what the text says. I don't think that Elisha was telling Haziel to lie. It was simply expressing a knowledge that he knew what was going to happen. See, the truth was that King Ben-Hadad would indeed recover from his illness. And the question that he asked was, will I recover from this illness? Yes, you will. But he didn't have too long to recover because he was assassinated 
He didn't die of the illness. Haziel does not know that he is to be the bearer of God's judgment. And he seems that it seems that uh, when Elisha is talking to him, that he may not have even realized what was in his own heart. And then there's this incredibly tense moment. I think it's one of the most intense moments that we, we read of in the Old Testament scriptures. It's really powerful. Elisha looks straight into Haziel's eyes. The NIV says he looked with a fixed gaze until Haziel lowers his eyes, embarrassed. Why? Because Elisha knows what's in his heart, and he knows what's coming next. And then Elisha starts to cry. Loud sobs of anguish. Because it's been revealed to him what's coming. Murder. Young men slaughtered. Children picked up and battered to death. Pregnant women, women's bellies ripped open so that their unborn children will not live. This guy is going to be a monster. He protests. How could a mere dog like me do this? Peterson in the message translates, translates it that the person who would do such a thing is like a wild animal. Where the NIV seems to take the tack that... Um, He's saying, well, sure, how could somebody as lowly as me become king? Actually, in annals that were written at the time, not, not in the Bible, it was said that Haziel came from a nobody family, that he was nobody before he became king. It shocked everybody. Just like Haziel, God knows our hearts. He knows what we really want whether it's power or whatever it is that we seek. He can see through our protests of, through me? Just like Elisha did. And he wants to have honest conversations with us, like Elisha was having with Haziel. Which won't happen if we pretend to ourselves that we are someone else. Well, king he became the very next day after he assassinated Ben-Hadad. We find in history that Haziel ruled for 46 years, a long rule in those days, and he greatly expanded the kingdom of Aram and defeated both the kings of Judah and Israel at different times. Everything that Elisha predicted or prophesied about him came true. Ironically enough, he called the son who would succeed him, Ben-Hadad, the same name as the man he murdered. I don't know about you, but when I read the story, I immediately thought of the greatest of the prophets, Jesus, Messiah, when he came to Jerusalem, bursting into tears, because he knew what was to come for that city. I talked about it on Sunday in the message about um, blessed are those who mourn. Elisha took no joy looking into the eyes of the man he knew would cause such misery. But he could not tell anything but the truth. Jesus took no joy in talking about the city that had rejected him, knowing what was to come. I mean, Haziel was hardly going to bring back a message to Ben Hadad, saying, Elisha says you're going to die because I'm going to kill you, not through your illness. The whole thing is a sombre story that teaches, us, that teaches us we cannot continue to worship anywhere else than the one true God and escape punishment. There's a time coming that Jesus prophesied about when he said there would be wars and famine and earthquakes, when the church would be persecuted and the whole world will mourn. He says, be always on the watch and pray so that you may be able to escape all that's about to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. It must have been a hard job being a prophet, knowing what God's judgment was going to look like. 
For those who come to Jesus with hearts that are poor in spirit, and in a sense mourning for their own brokenness and sinfulness, he raises them up. They will stand with the Son when he returns to earth, whenever that is. So let's do what Jesus says. Continue to pray and to watch. Be blessed today.